Per trickery, this grown man falling to his knees on the phone with Michael Jackson, crying and sobbing, begging him to come to Korea to perform. Because if he don't, he going to uh, hurt himself permanently. What kind of bullshit is that? Three days after the brief telephone conversation about the Jackson Mooney project, Frank Dillio was fired. Michael's publicist, Lee Salters, issued a terse statement. Michael Jackson and Frank Dillio have announced an amicable parting. Jackson said, I thank Frank for his contribution on my behalf during the past several years. Perhaps Michael felt he had valid reasons for firing Frank, but he did it in a cowardly way. He had John Bronco do it for him. You could tell he was sitting around in the room, stewing, burning the skin off his hand, concocting some kind of lunatic idea in his mind, saying, hmm, I think I'm gonna fire Frank Dillio today. That motherfucker's is too safe. I don't like people around me feeling too safe. I want them to have the same anxiety I have. And just called up John Bronca and said, Bronca fire Dillio. Bronca probably was like, what Bronca you in danger? Michael felt that Frank had taken too much credit for his success. He was tired of other people taking credit for what he felt was his own destiny. Because Michael refused to be interviewed, Frank had developed a high media profile as his spokesman. Many celebrities, and Michael is one of them, do not like it when their representatives also become celebrities. Michael's ego is fragile. Frank was becoming too well known for Michael's taste, giving interviews to the press, toting his accomplishments for Michael. Every time he did so, Michael cringed. Frank isn't even creative, Michael told an associate. Let's face it, I come up with all the ideas. Not that all your ideas were good ideas even. And hence, Thriller. Remember when you was getting ready to throw Thriller in the trash along with uh, Showtime and HBO's money in the trash, Michael Jackson? Child bang. The primary reason Michael dismissed Frank was because he was disappointed that Bad was not as successful as Thriller. It had only sold about 20 million copies worldwide, roughly one-fifth of what Michael had hoped for. Thriller sold 24 million in the United States. Bad sold 6 million. Michael was pissed off, said one friend of Frank Dillio's. He had his heart set on another huge album. When he didn't get what he wanted, he acted like a spoiled little kid. He threw temper tantrums. He cried. He can be very dramatic. Frank had his hands full. He had a lot to deal with. But we did the best we could, Frank said, of bad. We made the best album and the best videos we could. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. While that may be true, some were whispering in Michael's ear that Frank should have done a better job. Doubt began to creep into Michael's mind. He had to blame someone for what he thought was a weak showing for bad. Therefore, he blamed Frank Dillio. About a year later, Frank would say there was no warning. Did it anger me? Yes. The way it was done was an insult. He took away my faith in people. For a long time, I've not been as trusting. Frank felt that the least Michael could have done was fire him personally. After Frank Dillio's firing, Catherine Jackson's campaign to get Michael to go to Korea with his brothers continued, but Michael could not be swayed. In March 1989, Jerome Howard and Kenneth Choi, you know Jerome Howard, 
is the person in charge of Catherine and Joseph's uh, business practices. In March 1989, Jerome Howard and Choi were at the Jackson's estate in Encino with Catherine, Joseph, and Jermaine discussing the problem at hand. I think the best thing would be for him to get closer to his family, Jermaine said. Once you make so much money, it's just another dollar. At some point, you have to start looking at the important things like love, family, and health. As they were talking, the phone rang. Catherine took the call upstairs. Joseph followed. A few minutes later, Catherine came running down the stairs, huffing and puffing and saying, Michael's on the phone. Michael's on the phone. Joseph's talking to him right now. Jerome Howard recalled. She was very worked up about it. Jermaine ran to the staircase where Catherine was standing and in a very excited tone said to her, Mother, let Kenneth talk to Michael. Let Kenneth try to convince him. After all, he convinced you and Joseph in the first place. He should talk to Michael. Catherine was skeptical. I don't know if that's a good idea, she said as she ran back up the stairs. It was all so frantic. But pick up the phone and try, she hollered back at them. It can't hurt. According to Jerome, Jermaine ran back over to Kenneth. Look, man, you got to persuade Michael. But how? Kenneth asked helplessly. How do I do this? He looked bewildered. Man, I don't know, Jermaine answered. But you got to do it. Cry on the phone to him if you have to. Whatever. Just do it, man. Do it. Kenneth Choi picked up the telephone. Michael, please, my country wants you to come and perform, he said in broken English. There was a pause. Apparently, Michael was explaining why he didn't want to do the tour. But please, Michael, I beg you. Another pause. Suddenly, Kenneth began to weep. But Michael, if you don't come to my country to perform, I have no choice but to kill myself, he said. His tone theatrical. I mean it. I'll do it. In moments, Kenneth was sobbing uncontrollably. Jermaine took one look at him. Jermaine took one look at him and fell to his knees laughing. He had to hold his hand over his mouth to stifle the sound. That's why Michael don't mess with his family. You see the trickery? Per trickery, this grown man falling to his knees on the phone with Michael Jackson crying and sobbing, begging him to come to Korea to perform because if he don't, he going to uh, hurt himself permanently. What kind of bullshit is that? Jermaine took one look at him and fell to his knees laughing. He had to hold his hand over his mouth to stifle the sound. Then Jerome fell to the floor as well, laughing hysterically. Kenneth ignored them both. You see, this is my mission, he continued on the phone, tears cascading down his cheeks. My mission is to bring you, the great Michael Jackson, to Korea to perform for all the people there. I must see you. Please, I beg of you. Michael, please, please. Finally, Michael agreed to meet with Kenneth Choi. He never could resist a crying man. Soon after that, Jerome Howard quit working for Catherine and Joseph Jackson. I discovered that Kenneth Choi was meeting with Joseph and Catherine behind my back, cutting a side deal. When I saw this happening, I quit. I wouldn't have quit before I got my piece of chunk of change. Bullshit the baker. Finally, Kenneth Choi got the meeting with Michael Jackson he had so desired. Catherine brought him along with her to the Soul Train Awards where Michael was an honoree. When Catherine introduced him to her son, he dropped to his knees and kissed Michael's hand. My people need you, he told Michael. You must perform in Korea. After all, Japan attacked our country two times and you performed in Japan two times. You even held a Japanese baby in your arms. Huh? Michael asked. He looked perplexed. Who the heck are you? Mother, who is this person? Why, Michael, this is the nice man I told you about. Catherine said eagerly, Kenneth, you know the man who is putting together the concerts in Korea. From the look on his face, Michael didn't have the vaguest idea who his mother was talking about or why the man in front of him was on his knees. Girl, 
Michael know who the fat is. He don't remember that man weeping on the phone to him, crying belligerently on the phone to him. Swear. My people need to see you, Kenneth continued. You are a hero, a saint of men. He then pulled out a video camera and began taping Michael. No, wait, Michael said, putting his hand in front of his face. Stop. Is this the reunion thing? Is this what this is? Yes, Michael, Catherine said. Yes, this is him, Kenneth Choi. She was brimming with excitement. But I don't do business with family, Michael said, turning to Kenneth. And stop taping me. Stop it, I said. By June 1989, after almost six months of feeling pressured by everyone around him, Michael finally signed a contract to appear in Korea for four shows that would take place in August. I can't take another second of it, he said in explanation of his decision. These people are going to drive me crazy until they get what they want. So let's just do the shows and get it over with. He would perform only four songs, however, as well as a medley with his brothers. The rest of the show would be done by the brothers without Michael. Well, they got something. Amazingly, considering all that had occurred in the recent six months, when the deal was signed and it was time to pass the promised millions on to Michael, the Reverend Moon, who was to fund the venture, decided that the agreed upon amount was too high a price. According to Jerome Howard, Moon wanted Michael's payment lowered first to eight million, then to seven, then to five, then to 4.5, and finally to 2.5. Finally, the deal fell apart completely. Damn. As a result, Michael Jackson ended up being sued by Sergi Times Inc., which is financed by Reverend Moon, the Moonies. Kenneth Choi represented the Moonies. Moon wanted his money and all of the gifts to be returned. Also in the suit were Joseph, Catherine, Jerome Howard, Jermaine Jackson, and Bill Bray. Bill Bray, what the fuck did the security guard do? Michael in turn sued Sergi Times Inc. for $8 million saying that he was not giving back any of his gifts and not demanding that anyone else give back their gifts either. There's a disagreement among the participants of the Jackson Mooney project about who is responsible for what had occurred. But most associates of Michael's agreed that none of it would ever have happened if Frank Dillio had still been Michael's manager. Word. When being a ninja bites you in the ass. That's what he get. In the summer of 1989, after the Jackson Mooney project was no longer an issue for them, the Jackson family braced themselves for more distress from Latoya, who was 33 years old. They had heard that she was now writing a book of her own, one that would be nothing like the one penned by Michael. Hers, Latoya threatened, would tell the whole truth about my dysfunctional family. Latoya signed the deal with Putman, which advanced her more money for her autobiography than Michael had received for his from Doubleday. You know why? Because they know Michael Jackson be up to the bullshit and that Latoya is a nut. And you can always trust nuts to tell the truth. Because what do they have to lose? They ain't scared of backlash. And Michael's yeah. insecurities will always jab him in the throat, even though, nigga, you is in the ground. You hear me? Getting eaten by worms. Gonna make more money in the ground than we will ever see in our life. And this ninja care about other people's opinions of him? Michael's was reportedly a $300,000 deal. Latoya's $500,000. You can always depend on a nut to give you the truth. It won't be so bad, Catherine reasoned. What can she write about anyway? Everything. For starters, Latoya was going to claim that Michael had been sexually molested as a child. When word of this allegation got back to Michael, he was incensed by it. 
Also remember that Latoya said the same thing was happening to Reby. She can do what she wants if she wants to get back at Joseph and Catherine for whatever he stormed. But don't drag my ass into it. I never did one damn thing to hurt that girl. So stop her, Bronca, he told his attorney, John. During it, he told Jack that Michael did not want his sister writing that he'd been molested. Why not, Jack demanded to know. It's the truth. Look, man, I don't know if it's true or not, John told him. But I do know that if she writes it, Michael will sue her. That I effing know is true. Rumors that Michael was sexually molested as a child had been circulating for years within the entertainment industry. Michael denies it. With that denial in place, there's not much more anyone else can say about it. It certainly seems that if such a thing were true, it would be known by now considering how exposed Michael's life had been in recent years. In subsequent letters to LaToya and Jack, John Bronca reiterated his position at the meeting. That Jack Gordon, LaToya's husband, manager, slash boyfriend, I don't know, puppet master, I don't know. But we do know that he did put an offer out there. Listen, if you don't want LaToya to talk about the OLED station, then you probably need to give us a couple of hundred thousand, maybe even a million. Jack Gordon telephoned Catherine's ex-business manager, Jerome Howard, to inquire as to whether he still had the power to arrange meetings with Catherine. According to Jerome, Jack wanted to offer Catherine a deal. If she and Joseph paid LaToya $5 million, LaToya would cancel her memoirs. It's the least they can do for her, Jack reasoned, considering all they have done to her. Moreover, if Jerome was the one who could convince the Jackson parents to pay LaToya the money, he would be paid 10% of the total 500000 Man, that's blackmail, Jerome said, according to his memory. No, it's not, Jack responded. It's business, plain, simple business. Well, I don't want anything to do with it, Jerome told him. I'll present the deal to Catherine and have her to get in touch with you about it. What? You don't want $500,000, Jack asked incredulously. Jerome said no. I telephoned Catherine and then met with her, Jerome recalled. I told her what was going on. If she wanted to stop her daughter's book, it was going to cost her five million bucks. She wasn't pleased. I also told her I didn't want to get involved, that Jack had offered me a percentage, but that I didn't think it was fair money. I suggested she should have her lawyer deal with it. I suppose she did. After that, someone in Latoya's camp apparently fed a story to the media that Michael had offered her $12 million to kill the project. According to an associate of Michael's, what really happened is. You say that you know me.